Good morning, everybody, and thanks for being with us this morning. I'm proud of Carbon Nation for being up so early today. We hope today's program is worth, worth the extra effort. We're coming to you a little earlier today than we did last time, so we're going to move it around a little bit and try to keep it fresh. Don't adjust your computer monitors this morning. There really is two of us here today. Uh, we, uh, we've invited one of our team members from Christian Arms to be with us today. And uh, so kind of how the program is going to work today. We're going to introduce our, our guest today. And then later, after we've introduced John, we're going to have John join us for some of your questions again. We had so many quality questions last time that were very pertinent to what you guys want to know. And so we're going to review a few of those later. So that's kind of how we'll end the program. But initially, let's all welcome John. John Squires with us. Uh, John, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and who you are as far as Christian Arms goes? Thank you, Jeff. Um, yeah, I'm Director of Engineering for Christian Arms, um, and I get to do quite a bit of things with the, the job that I've got here. Uh, we get involved with all aspects of the company, you know, purchasing and production down to shipping. So we're, we get around, and I've got a great group of guys that I get to work with as well. So part of what we're doing today, in essence, is giving, the, giving our customers and our dealers a little bit of a peek behind the curtain as to what goes on within, on the engineering side of the house and even with new product development. So, John, what do day, what's an average day? What does that look like to you as, as director of engineering in the company? You know, days are definitely full. There's a lot going on for sure for us right now. Everyone knows in the firearms business that things are just going crazy. But I can tell you for sure that when I leave the factory on most evenings, John's car is still in the parking lot. So he works later than I do. Yeah. So my typical day would start out with a quick stand up meeting in the morning where we get to meet with different departments throughout the plant maintenance. We do a quick walk through visiting the different areas and stuff so we can kind of keep a pulse on what's going on in the plant, how things are running. After that, I get to move back into uh, working in the engineering department itself. Uh, we've got a number of engineers that are working here. Uh, we go and review projects, look at the tasks and stuff that we've got at hand and, and try and get those done as quickly as we possibly can. Uh, again, the people who work with this company, all of them, great bunch of people, very passionate about their work. It's a great place to be. And I really believe it's because of your team a lot of days that we succeed as a company. We've mentioned more than once the growth, the, 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 how fortunate we are to have grown the way we have lately. And part of the reason we've been able to facilitate that growth is because of John and his team of engineers. So we owe quite a bit to him. Uh, John, so uh, how, one of the things I think everybody wants to know is how as a company do we decide what projects we move forward with and what ones do we not move forward with? That's a great question. You know, we do get a lot of feedback from customers. So customer feedback on how things are working in the field for them uh, is great you know, feedback for us to understand what is going on. A lot of times even the product suggestion we get and oh, we, we pay attention to those. So if you're out there, we listen to what you say. We are sensitive to customer feedback. Yep. Uh, so customer feedback and, you know, is, in the firearms business, with the passion we have for this, we'd love to build everything we possibly could, but that's just not possible. So we do have to do a little bit of uh, choosing, picking of what's going on with that. So some of the other places that we look for some input would be from, you know, we've got people we run tests and stuff with that are out in the mm -hmm. field. Another big group that we actually pull from is actually our own employees. Mm -hmm. uh, their experiences in the field, how they're running with the guns, putting it through their paces. So we get a, a bunch of good feedback with that. I got to be honest with you, John. There are days when I see one of your engineering team headed out to the range <laughs> with a firearm that I've never seen before. And I just want to say, hey, take me with you. You know, <laughs> you guys get to do a lot of really neat stuff. And like John mentioned, the engineering team involves a lot of the production guys and other people, the barrel guys. They involve them in a lot of the research and development. So it's not just one little bunch of people in the company moving those projects forward. They spread it out and delegate it in a really, really good manner, and that's how they get uh, how they get made, designed and made. Yeah, that's uh, one of my favorite things that being able to do is the design part of this. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite firearms that we've been able to design and build has been the Little Ranger 22 that you see here. It's uh, what I liked about this design on this gun here is we actually decided we're going to do clean slate. We're not just modifying a little component here, a little component there. We wanted to start 
fresh and build ground up on it. So this gun was an entire design build from the start. Started with input from all of our sources that we look for, for kind of what characteristics do we want in this gun. Mm -hmm. uh, we wanted to make sure we had, you know, a, a Remington 700 style compatible trigger in here exactly. so that you can get, you know, because triggers are an opinion thing. Well, and on so many, and on so many rim fire options, you are stuck with what came on the gun. Mm -hmm. You don't have the ability to upgrade or change that trigger like you do with the Ranger yep. 22, so. Absolutely, so we included that feature in there. We wanted to, another reason we chose this gun as well is we did not have, you know, rim fire in our uh, lineup of uh, products, and so this is a great addition to the to our lineup. It's probably appropriate to mention too, if you, if you own a Ranger 22 now, we will have declinated rails available on the web store. We will have a 20 minute, a 40 minute, and a 60 minute declinated rail available for the Ranger 22. That optic rail is proprietary, so the only real place you can get it is from us. And we've got those coming in the very, very near future for all the Ranger owners. Absolutely, absolutely. So, and one of the great things about having kind of an open slate on this, it did create, you know, some challenges and stuff. So there were several things we had to work through to be able to get this to function as well as it has functioned for us. So. It was a great balance for us and the team that worked on it. Um, again, we love doing it. And I can tell you for sure, based we talked about customer feedback and what our dealers and customers are telling us about the gun. In addition to the challenges of the rifle and, and starting all over with a, with a clean slate, one of the things that we hear over and over and over again about this little Ranger 22 is A, 5.1 pounds, extremely lightweight firearm. And the other is, with that carbon tension barrel, the way that that barrel has been manufactured and then properly carbon tensioned has made it an extremely accurate rifle. People just can't, they, it's a wonderfully accurate rifle. Absolutely. So kudos to, kudos to you guys. It worked. Yep. Uh, let's talk about the MPR, John. We've got one right here in front of us. Most of us know that that was the 2020 rifle of the year last year. Mm -hmm. The Modern Precision Rifle has just been a tremendously successful rifle. And part of the reason for that is because it has so much customer appeal. It can be used in a lot of different ways. Tell us a little bit about the background of that rifle. So on the NPR itself, I was not able to be a part of the design process on that. So as I've talked with the guys that are here that have worked on the design on this thing, you know, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears went into the bringing this rifle to where it at is today. Um, you know, some of the things they wanted to put into this this rifle here was definitely something different from our traditional stocks that we've got. We wanted to have make sure that it was fairly light, um, usable, and the uh, you know the Jason Christensen had commented that he wanted something that kind of looked a little bit aerospace. -y. Exactly. So yeah, exactly. It was uh, interesting for me to find that the lead engineer at the time that worked on this uh, project actually ended up using or had the F-117 Nighthawk on his screensaver as inspiration to help him. Yeah, that was his, his aerospace up. inspiration yeah. in building the gun. So maybe this would even be an F-A-117 of the of the holding rifles, the chassis rifles. So, Well, it certainly has worked out very, very well for us. And some of the things that people really love about the gun that we were fortunate enough to design into it is the adjustable cheek rise adjustable length of pull it feeds well from an AICS compatible magazine and again it's a Remington 700 trigger so it is adjustable so been a great gun it, it's why it has a wide base of appeal because it's really great on the range you can you can put a bipod on it and lay either prone or on a bench and it'll serve you very very well at distance on the range and we have a lot of guys quite honestly that fold that stock and slide that rifle right into their backpack sure. and take off hunting and so it, it does a lot of things very, very well and has been tremendously popular for us. So we're grateful for that success for sure. Absolutely. Looking forward to future product as well. And that's the one thing we can say before we leave John too much and, and get into questions, we can tell you that there are a lot of really new and exciting things for us down the road. As a company, we're a little bit careful about announcing something prematurely until we've done our due diligence and we make sure that those projects are projects that we're going to move right. forward with, but would you not agree? We've got some really, really oh, great stuff. exciting stuff coming. Even um, in, even in 2021, still uh -huh. we're not we're not done for this year. We're just kind of getting started. So we've got a lot of really, really great stuff coming up. So with that, John, let's work our way into some questions. Our first question comes to us from Ryan, and Ryan asks us, "Hey guys, are 
or they you know we'll, we'll we'll do Charlene's question first. Charlene asks, are there any plans for the ridge line being chambered in the new 6.8 Western? That's a very, very good question. That's a brand new offering, just been released by Olin and Winchester. You're gonna see some, some firearms made in that caliber. I can tell you this, for us, we do now have a chamber reamer and go no-go gauges and some ammunition. So we've started that process where we do our research, our development, we'll, 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 we'll just see how it develops. Uh, probably safe to say at this point, there's not any real immediate plans to roll out 6.8 Western but it certainly is a possibility. No, not quite yet, but we're definitely looking into what we can do with this. Yeah, so. we are. So there is some value ballistically to that new caliber, no doubt about it. So our next question comes to us from Ryan. And Ryan asks, hey guys, I'm wondering what brand and grain of bullets you're having the best luck with out of a Ridgeline and 300 wind mag. Ryan, you probably know, as most of us do, every barrel is a little bit different. We can make 10 barrels on the same day and they don't all shoot exactly the same thing. They're like people. Some guys like uh, cheeseburgers and pizza, and other guys like tofu. That's not true. <laughs> yeah, but they don't all shoot exactly the same brand of ammunition and bullet weight exactly the same. Historically, for us at the factory, we've seen tremendous results with uh, Nosler Trophy Grade loaded with the 180 Acubon. Every once in a while, we have a 300 wind mag that shoots the 195 long range Acubon as well. Most of our 300 wind mags will shoot the Hornady 200 grain ELDX bullets well. And then if you're lucky enough to find a box of the new Berger 215 hybrid bullets. Berger loads a hybrid bullet in their 300 wind mag ammunition. And that, as a match ammunition, that stuff is really, really good. So Brandon has asked us, John, I'm looking at saving up for the BA tactic and I'd like to hear from people that have experienced the rifle. I want to use it as a hunting rifle at 6.5 PRC. Any insight would be appreciated. You know, it's a great, a great question on that one. That the BA Tactical is a, is a great gun, 6.5 PRC, a great cartridge as well for a hunting situation. For most, you know, one thing to consider possibly on that one, for very comfortable stock to shoot. But on that BA Tac, that platform was designed a little bit more towards the tactical environment, so it's got a drop box magazine on it. It does have. I'm going to stand up. that up there real quick so we can see. It does have a, a release lever here on the Dropbox magazine that can sometimes get in the way as you're carrying it up in the field, exactly. stuff like that. Yep. Might want to look at the ELR. The ELR rifle, same stock as the BA, you'll get the same feel, but it has an internal magazine, so you don't have the, the longer Dropbox release lever that's sticking out. Again, either one of those would be a great option for, for hunting, so yep, it maybe would. something to consider. The ELR was designed specifically to be a crossover or a hybrid between a great rifle on the range during the summer and then serving you well in the field carried on your shoulder on a hunt. So Brandon, the BA Tactical will sure work for you. With that extended mag release though and some of the other features of it, you may be a little bit better off to, to look at a sister rifle, the cousin rifle, and that is the ELR in the same caliber. 6.5, that 6.5 caliber is a great mid to, mid to small size, oh, yeah. medium size game caliber Absolutely. too. So. Yeah, the only challenge with the 6.5 PRC right now, and I'll just tell you this in case you're not aware, good luck finding ammunition for it. If you make firearms and you're having a hard time finding ammunition, you know it's pretty tough to find. So our next question, John, is from Cameron. He asks, here's a question for the group. No, Jeremy, we're thinking about buying the, the MPR in a Desert Brown Anodize, if I can find it in stock. What caliber do you guys recommend for long range accuracy? Well, that's a great question, Jeremy. You know, and people ask the question about long range accuracy. There's kind of two questions that I like to, you know, bring up as we talk about that. So there's kind of a long range target mm -hmm. and then a long range hunt. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so if you're looking at kind of the long range target where you might pull several shots one right after the other, you might want to consider a little bit smaller caliber so that you can deal with more of the recoil management exactly. in the firearm itself. Yeah. Uh, you're not necessarily carrying out a lot of energy, uh, you know, six, a six millimeter Creedmoor, six five Creedmoor, great cartridges for reaching out there. They don't have quite the energy, but great long range target uh, platform. If you're interested in more of the long range hunting and need to carry some energy out there, you know, definitely go to a little bit bigger magnums, the 300 Win Mag, 300 PRC or 338 Lapu if you want to go, yep. go for yep. it, so. Yep, and those, and those larger calibers too, 
will buck wind a little bit better downrange, and they'll they'll even be great long range rifles if you're just doing paper and steel. Right. So it just a lot of that depends on the intended purpose of the rifle and what distance you intend to shoot. So we hope we helped you there. Our next question comes to us from Cameron, and Cameron asks us, "Here's a question for the group: For a 28 nozzler, which barrel would last longer, the one on the Mesa or the one on the Ridgeline?" And when you talk about barrel life, really, John, it all comes down to how we as shooters manage the heat in our barrel. It's the heat in the barrel that, that degrades the barrel, but not so much that copper jacketed bullet going down the bore. Right. Yeah, and, and that would be one thing to consider with, you know, the steel versus the carbon itself. Carbon fiber is a great conductor of heat. And the way that the fibers run and stuff in the barrels here, it does help pull some of the heat away from that the chamber area as it's getting warm. So you might get a little bit longer life out of the carbon wrap barrel, but the biggest thing is just kind of managing the heat as a shooter and making sure that. And kind of a general rule of thumb, and like John mentioned, our, our studies show that there's the potential for a carbon wrap barrel to last a little bit longer because of that characteristic. Part of what we, meant, what we recommend to people in customer service is, if you're able to hold your barrel at the chamber comfortably with your hand, you're probably okay as far as heat goes. But if the, if the chamber portion of your barrel is extremely hot to the touch for your hand, then you probably, if you're able, you want to manage that heat perhaps and just give it a chance to cool a little bit. So, so those are all really, really great questions. Um, we were asked by John Condy, and this is a question I've heard a couple of times, will you be making the modern precision rifle in a titanium action? Uh, great question. And, and it kind of makes sense because that titanium action would save us a few ounces mm -hmm. in the platform. But John, honestly, right now, there aren't any real immediate plans to, to offer the titanium receiver in the modern precision rifle platform. I can tell you we've got a couple of guys that bought a Ridgeline TI or a Mesa TI and rolled that barreled action over into their chassis. But as a company, we're probably not looking to do that anytime real soon. So, but that's a great question. Uh, Lynn asked us, Lynn Gatchel, I have a Mesa long range, 300 PRC. Can I adjust the trigger pull and not affect the warranty or is that a no-no? That's a great question. We get asked that a lot and it's a little bit tricky to answer because if you're not trained in proper trigger adjustment and you adjust the trigger too far, trying to get down to a, to a trigger pull weight that the, that the trigger itself is not capable of, you can introduce the unsafe physical characteristic in the firearm called following where you disrupt the connection between the sear and the cocking piece, and as you close your bolt, the firing pin will fall. That's referred to as following. And if you don't properly understand the, the, the correct way to adjust that trigger, that you can have that condition in your gun. Yes, you can. It's so something to be very, very careful with. Typically, we tell people, if you're looking for a one pound trigger in any of our firearms, you're probably gonna need to upgrade the trigger. The trigger tech triggers that ship in these guns We'll leave the factory, factory setting about three and a half pounds. That's where the president of the company wants them set. They are capable of going down to two and a half, maybe two pounds. But uh, to get to one pound, it would probably require uh, an additional upgrade to your trigger. Part of the reason for our difficult trigger adjustment is in our, in our firing mechanisms, we use a 32 pound spring, whereas the industry tends to gravitate more toward a 28 pound spring. And so with that stronger firing mechanism spring, the trigger pull weight is a little bit tougher to adjust down. So a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things enter into that. But if you want a real, real low trigger weight, you probably need to go with an upgraded trigger. So I know we didn't answer his question directly. You got to be very, very careful. We recommend trigger adjustments done by a gunsmith. So, but, but trigger techs are great triggers. Absolutely. We've had a lot of very, very positive feedback on them. So, uh, we've got a question from Bill Walters. Was wondering with the shortage of ammo, was there a better, faster way to break the barrel in on a ridgeline with less shots? Thank you. And, and Bill, we empathize with you because both John and I suffer from, from ammunition deficiency just like everybody else does. And there is a way, Bill. There's an acceptable way to abbreviate that barrel break-in for you. What we would recommend in the absence of a 40 or a 50 round barrel break-in the bottom line is you just want to provide that barrel with the very best start to life. And so if you're going to do an abbreviated 20 round barrel break in, we would recommend you shoot the firearm once and then we have you run a wet patch through the barrel. And what we mean by that, 
a clean white patch soaked with a copper dissolving solvent from the chamber to the muzzle, remove the patch, put the, put the push rod through again, put a clean white patch on it, and run a clean, dry white patch through the barrel to remove the copper dissolving solvent and then shoot again. We call that shoot clean. And we would recommend you just do shoot clean for 20 rounds, and that will do a very, very good job of giving your, giving your barrel a good start to life in the absence of a lot more ammunition. <laughs> yeah, we saw so, more of that. So that's a great question, and that would be our advice to you, John. What does John, what does John Walrap wonder? Let's see, he says, I have a new CA9MM. I have followed the barrel break-in procedure. It shoots great. Do you recommend a bore guide or for cleaning it if I'm using a cleaning rod? You know, cleaning rods are one thing you definitely need to be careful of because they can damage barrels. So using a cleaning rod to help, or a, a bore guide, excuse me, to help with the, a, pushing that rod through the barrel is a good thing to do for sure. And a lot of things too, a, a, a bore guide in many cases will help to minimize the possibility or the potential for cleaning solvents and, and debris to fall mm -hmm. down into the trigger group. So there's probably a generic uh, uh, MSR platform bore guide that would work for you. If you can find one that will fit the CA9MM, we would obviously recommend you use that. But if you're careful, you can clean your firearm just as good without a, without a bore guide. So if you can find one, great, we'd recommend you use it. But if you have one not available, don't let that stand in your way of trying to keep your firearm clean. Absolutely. So great question. Uh, Rob, uh, does the continuous and homogenous bullets have any effect on the carbon wrap? They do not. Like we mentioned, the carbon wrap is over a 416R stainless barrel. So on the inside of the bore, our barrels are just like the industry barrels. Yeah. The, the real difference is outside of that bore of the rifle with the proprietary wrap of aerospace carbon fiber in different layers to do different jobs. So to shoot to shoot an all copper bullet or homogenous bullet really doesn't affect the carbon wrap on the barrel. Uh, it, they should shoot just fine in our firearm just like they would anybody else's firearm. No real distinction there. No, it's you fine to go with it. In fact, in some states they're required to shoot an all copper bullet. Mm -hmm. They don't have a choice. So. Yep, we should be fine there. Uh, next question comes to us from Dalton Barnes. Any plans on the new chamberings for the MPR? We would love to see 22250 or 22 Creedmoor. And we get asked a lot of other pipe, 22 Valkyries. Yep. What about 22 Valkyrie in the in the MPR? We're you know we're looking at and we always like says appreciate the feedback and looking what's there. Uh, we've had a few people that have asked about that, but we do yeah. not have at this point in time intentions of actually adding those calibers but again keep letting us know what you guys want we'll definitely consider adding those to the part of what of. part of what drives that is as a company we work very very closely with national accounts cabela shield sportsman's warehouse and a lot of our really really large dealers and that resource literally has decades of firearms experience will ammunition be available for that caliber uh you know if i had 10 of those on my shelf could i sell one and so based on customer feedback and then the feedback we get in the industry, we kind of use that formula to decide what would be good for us to roll out. We, we wish we could make a gun for everybody that sent in an email. We just unfortunately don't have that luxury. We've got to make a firearm that is financially viable in the marketplace. And so that's kind of the scale that we use. I wouldn't be surprised if you see some of those calibers in the future. But as of right now, we don't have a lot of immediate plans to roll anything out like that. So our next question uh, from Donald Griffin. I have an ELR uh, that I want to convert to an accepted an AICS magazine. Does the bottom metal that you offer fit without gunsmithing or will it need to be inlet by a gunsmith? And David, a lot of that depends, and John, you know this, it depends on whether it's a short action or a long action caliber. A short action caliber will require a greater degree of inletting in the opening of the, of the stock for the magazine than will a long action caliber. You will probably have at least some minor inletting to work with, but any Remington 700 compatible DBM bottom metal can be made to fit your ELR, and then it could accept an AICS magazine. Have you ever done that on any of your guns, converted them? You know, I haven't, because I always order them with the yeah. drop box in it already, so um, I, I haven't uh, done that yet. I've actually had the chance to, to me and some friends convert a couple of guns. It's not, it's not a real, it's not a real challenging thing to do. 
there are a lot of kits out there in addition to our bottom metal, which is available on our web store, that will facilitate that. You just need to go into that project knowing that you might have to have some minor gun, some minor uh, inletting, sometimes by a gunsmith, to have that bottom metal properly fit. One of the concerns you need to worry about, and you know this with engineering and geometry, you want to make sure that your bottom metal is inletted to fit so that the AICS magazine is the proper distance from the bolt as it rides forward. You can't have your bottom metal too close or too far away from your action or it won't work. So it's a little bit tricky, but a lot of guys do it. A lot of guys have done it successfully. So, yeah. Uh, our next question from Stephen Graham. Jeff, what brand beard wax do you recommend? Uh, there are some secrets that are very, very proprietary. We don't mind telling you a lot about our firearms and stuff, but as far as my beauty regimen, some of those secrets I just got to keep close. I can't, I can't just be sharing that stuff with everybody. So Stephen Graham, I'll send you a personal message on what brand beard wax. If you can grow one, I'll get you through it. So I'll be glad to help. Looks like uh, Dean Gebhardt has asked, uh, has the CA considered taking a look at the bolt handle design on the Mesa Ridge line of the Diverse? Many of the uh, scopes that are being put on these rifles have uh, large oculars. Large oculars create a, a problem with the bolt handle clearance. Um, we, we currently, we're not looking at the bolt handles themselves. We've got some surprises coming down the line of some changes in that area, so. Uh, that's one, of the, that's one of the phenomenons though that we've seen in optics, especially hunting and long range optics. We have seen lately a larger objective bell diameter and certainly the ocular bell diameters have gotten not only larger, but they've gotten longer. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of that just contributes to a much better optic. One of the considerations, if you've got one of those rifles that ships with a smaller standard hunter bolt knob, if you were to roll that over to an extended tactical bolt knob, that gets your hand further away from the optic itself. And a lot of guys have alleviated that clearance issue by simply installing a larger tactical bolt knob that you can get right off the web store. If you decide you're gonna change that bolt knob though, one, one cautionary statement, build a good amount of heat into that small hunter bolt knob, that standard bolt knob. Get a hair dryer or something, build a ton of heat into that little aluminum bolt knob to help relieve the, the lock, the thread locking of the red Loctite, then it should come right off. And our tactical bolt knob is a, is a really, really easy replacement. For reference, our bolt handles are threaded 5 16 24. So they're threaded the standard Remington bolt knob thread. So easy, easy, easy thing to change. Uh, Edward's wondering, Edward O'Neill, what are your thoughts on chambering the CA-10 and 6mm Creedmoor? I love this round for targets in your modern precision rifle. As you know, probably Edward, right now, we do offer the CA-10 DMR and, and our other 10 platforms chambered in 6.5 Creedmoor. We've considered expanding that to 6 Creedmoor. However, we just feel like at this point, no immediate plans because there just isn't quite enough customer and dealer demand for that caliber in that platform. But I would support you, Edward. I would vote for 6 mm Creedmoor in our large frame CA-10s, especially a DMR. Oh, absolutely. Most of us shoot a, a 6mm Creedmoor in our bolt guns, and it would certainly be a logical step to go to a 10, but we're just not at that point yet as a company. So, But it's a great question. All right, well, John, it's been a lot of fun having you here today. Welcome to Rapid Fire it Fridays. You're now a veteran. Before we go, just in case uh, inquiring minds want to know, you can see John has a, a, a hoodie on that we haven't seen before in any of our broadcasts. John's wearing one of a prototype of a new line of apparel that we will make available on our web store in the very near future. We're gonna update quite a few things on our web store with a lot of our apparel being one of them. Uh, we're working on some new designs and some new fabrics and stuff. And so we will have a lot of new selections as far as apparel and other items go on our web store in the very, very near future. Part of our success, and we'll just be honest about this, if you've known our company and followed our company very long, part of the success we're realizing right now can be attributed to company leadership and creative direction. We have marketing folks now that have, that have opened our eyes to business opportunities and, and increased our social footprint and come up with really dynamic ways to grow our company. And that's one of them, oh, a really, really well-run uh, web store 
with innovative products that our customers want to buy. And so with their direction, we're going to have a lot of exciting new stuff available to our loyal customers. So we appreciate you guys being involved. Uh, we're very, very appreciative of you sharing this time with us this morning. Uh, we we uh, look forward to future broadcasts. We've enjoyed these a great deal. And we've had a lot of positive feedback from customers and dealers as far as us being more interactive with our dealers and our customers. So keep in touch with us. Follow us on social media. If you're interested in some new swag to wear while you're watching Brand uh, Rapid Fire Fridays, go to the web store and get some, get some apparel so you can be part of the team when you watch. And John, I think you'd agree we've both spent some time at the range. As we leave, we would always counsel everybody, be a good steward of the shooting sports. Shoot, shoot, shoot straight, shoot safely, and uh, in, enjoy the shooting sports and involve some youth, some other people that haven't shot before. That's one of the great things about our jobs. We get to involve a lot of people in the shooting mm -hmm. sports maybe that haven't been. So it's been very, very rewarding for us. So again, everybody, thanks for joining us this morning. We appreciate you being a part of the team. Uh, let's just make Carbon Nation stronger and stronger going forward and have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you.